y'all. The secrecy of people in this town blows my mind. Christy <laughs> and her fiance. When I tell y'all, I care more about the relationship between the ants in my front yard than I care about the relationship between Christy and her fiance. Hello, beautiful people. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. In this video, I will be recapping episode three of the series from now, y'all, I am late. I am behind. Currently, I only have episodes one and two on my channel. And I'm not sure how I'm going to do this video because I'm behind three episodes. I don't know if I'm going to put three, four, and five just all lumped together in this one video or if I'm going to make them separate. But by the time you watch this, you'll know what, what it is by the title. Um, I just finished episode three. And of course, I said in my video for episode two that I was completely done with this show. Um, but you guys, a few of you have asked for me to continue covering it. So here I am suffering for the second of the subscribers y'all look I, I'm so over this show but you know what whatever let's get into the damn recap <laughs> now at the top of episode three we have Boyd and Ellis having a conversation and Ellis is trying to inquire about what exactly happened when his dad went out into the forest and Boyd is pretty much giving him kind of a vague answer half truth half omitting the truth he pretty much tells Ellis that one moment Sarah told him to go in a tree and the next moment he just ended up back in town and Ellis is like so you transported like how exactly did you end up back here and again Boyd is just being kind of elusive and Ellis ends up saying look if you don't want to tell me then just say so and Ellis is pretty much upset and fired up like look you said you were going to go out there and get answers and you came back with nothing and pretty much Ellis is so on edge because of Fatima we know how ridiculous she acted in the episode where it was nightfall for the first time with all the people from the bus and he feels like the people who don't make it is because they lose a piece of themselves and he felt like he sees that happening with Fatima and that's why he's so upset but his dad ends up telling him that Ellis you have to be that piece and Ellis pretty much resolves his little inquiry with his dad about what happened still like walking away still not really knowing exactly what happened now jumping ahead a bit Boyd is a pretty elusive when he talks to Donna when he talks to Ellis he isn't really telling anyone exactly what happened out in the forest and the only truth he really tell I mean he isn't lying per se he's just omitting and the the only real truth he tells is when he explains to Ellis that he doesn't know what happened to Sarah that she told him she would be right behind him he don't know if she dead alive or where she is but I kind of feel like he's being elusive because he himself probably hasn't fully processed it exactly but also he's being elusive because he doesn't want to tell anyone about these worms under his skin which y'all the secrecy of people in this town blows my mind <laughs> now we end up seeing Jim Tabitha and their kids Jim is in the little hospital and the y'all when the camera pans to Julie why was her face facial expression looking like that like that was irking me she had kind of like a attitude I don't know what that actress thought she was giving but when the camera Pan from Jim in bed over to his kids and we saw Julie's face. What was with that facial expression? But anyway, um, Tabitha asked the kids to give her a second with Jim or Jim asked her to give her a second. Y'all, I don't know. I literally just saw the episode, but it's so much just dribble. One of them asked the kids to give them a moment so that the parents can talk. And Tabitha ends up telling Jim that she followed the wires and they went nowhere. Having electricity doesn't make any sense. The wires were just hanging from the ceiling. But this feels not so sensical. Why do we keep trying to find logic in an illogical situation. 
Of course that electricity doesn't make sense. Why is that a shock, awe, or surprise? Going down a road that goes nowhere makes no sense. Being in a town you can't leave makes no sense. Having these monsters, ghosts, dead, whatever they are, come out at night to try and kill you makes no sense. Being able to hang this a talisman up and that's the only way they can get you makes no, nothing makes sense here. So why are we even harping on or shocked by or surprised by the electricity, the, the wires go nowhere and it doesn't make any sense. Duh, bitch. No, it ain't gonna make no sense. I'm sorry, child. Look, Tabitha, I'm not calling you a bitch, but it don't make no sense that this is even a topic of interest. All the other stuff we need to talk about after motherfucking wires. Now, Jim ends up being like, oh, we have so much to talk about, but baby, don't nobody talk. Tabitha doesn't, she tells him about the wires, but she doesn't tell him about finding the monster's resting place underground. That seems to me like more of a topic of conversation than the motherfucking wires. They literally, they being Victor and Tabitha, find this underground place where all the monsters hibernate during the daytime and we come out in this cave opening that we don't tell anyone about. We don't try to cut off that cave opening. Whatever the hell. <laughs> now, y'all, I said in the first episode and I think I might have said it in the season finale of last season because that's when we first first see the bus arrive but I felt like this bus arriving was the worst idea it made me like I, I was all I was hesitant for the new season because I just was like I don't want no bus full of new people we already have a ton of questions that haven't been answered why are we throwing new folk into the mix and also I didn't and want to have annoying characters and the stereotypical a-hole character y'all that's what we got that's what we got I don't know the guy name but the guy from the bus who was being an a-hole when Elgin was having his moment on the bus which y'all ain't leading nowhere um <laughs> I thought that at first he felt like the stereotypical a-hole character for no reason but when he also Offered to be a good Samaritan and help Jim when his wife was buried under the house. I felt like, oh, okay, well, maybe he's not gonna be the stereotypical a hole character. Yes, he is, child. So we end up having this argument with Donna and the new guy, the jerk character. And y'all, the argument is he wants to carry his rifle. Donna is telling him that's not how it works. And he's been a complete jerk to her. And Boyd walks over and he lets him know, look, residents don't carry weapons, period. They don't carry guns. And that's the rule. So the guy's just like, well, rules change F y'all. And Boyd pretty much lets him know, look, okay. You can take your rifle and you can go live out in the woods and make whatever rules you want to make. But if you want a roof over your head at night when those things come, I suggest you put the fucking rifle down. <laughs> I still enjoy Boyd, Donna, and Victor. Uh, the actor of Boyd, who I know his name, but child, I can't pronounce it. Love him. But so I got a little enjoyment out of that scene in particular but I feel like this guy gonna be trouble that's just how I feel but honestly I'm not even invested enough to even theorize or predict or care to anything that you know could come or could be foreshadowed because I know nothing's gonna lead anywhere so I feel like he's just gonna be nothing but trouble but whatever the hell chapter <laughs> But then at the end of this whole altercation, when the guy finally gives up his rifle, we got all the folks from the bus standing there watching or whatever. I don't like how they was looking. What is with all the facial expressions that these actors is giving me? I didn't like it. The way the bus driver was looking when that whole scuffle happened and boy, you know, got the rifle back. I, 
I, ugh, it's like it was a look of kind of contempt, dislike. I don't know. I didn't like how the onlookers were looking over at this situation. Um, I'm going to presume and hope that they looking at they, you know, fellow bus traveler like that and not looking at Boyd and <laughs> Donna like that because it's something with how they were looking that I just didn't like. Now, we end up seeing Tabitha at the diner with the kids and she looks over at the collapsed house and they throw in some eerie music. Why? It ain't gonna mean nothing. It ain't gonna go nowhere, child. We had so many little mini mysteries in season one that haven't even been answered. So why are y'all panning over to this damn collapsed house and playing eerie music when we know ain't nothing gonna come of that? Y'all, Victor told us in season one, the trees are moving closer. That ain't going nowhere. <laughs> Why did y'all pan over to, cause they, y'all, see, this is why I'm, y'all, look, y'all want me to watch it, I'll watch the child, and it's just irking my nerves. <laughs> cause nothing don't mean nothing, and never will mean nothing, and I already know that, so it just irks my nerves to watch. So, Tabitha ends up going to Kenny's mom, because his mom is the one who pretty much is in charge of this whole storage thing where she, you know, keeps all the stuff, you know, that comes into town from people who died and stuff like that. And of course, all of Tabitha and her family stuff, minus Julie, because Julie was living at community house but anyway all of their stuff was in the house that collapsed so they don't have anything and the mom Kenny's mom is like you know moms have to stick together y'all can come live with us so now we have Kenny his mom Jade Julie Tabitha Ethan and Jim all living in one house. But I'm a little child, like a big house. It got at least be four, five bedroom house, child. Probably a den and a living room, maybe even an office. So it ain't like they crammed in a little <laughs> space. Don't seem like to me anyway. Now we end up having Tabitha and Julie go to the little storage place. Looks like a barn or something to get some supplies. And this, y'all, did I I just not pay attention to something since when is Julie living in town because they have a conversation between Julie and Tabitha where Julie is like so are we staying with Kenny and Jade them now and I'm saying like what you mean we you chose community house and they told us in the ceremony the choosing ceremony in season one that you either pick community house or you pick the town and it ain't no take back seats like once you pick that's it so how is julie suddenly living with her family and what was even the catalyst for that we were already in a dangerous situation to when we first did the choosing ceremony and you chose to not be with your family to be in community house with a bunch of strangers so so why now are you with your family y'all did I did I miss the rationale for how that came to be but anyway when they go outside of the little storage area Tabitha ends up seeing things she sees two dead ghost kids who even cares because Jay saw the dead soldiers in season one and that never came like nothing came of that so whatever the hell not Tabitha seeing things Elgin was seeing things uh everybody seeing things child and it just don't ever mean nothing so whatever the hell <laughs> oh yeah and also I forgot to say jumping back to Boyd and Donna by the bus when he gets the rifle from the jerk he ends up, Boyd ends up asking Donna, like, what are supplies looking like? And Donna tells him it's not good. The storm wiped out, I want to say, half of their crops. And they're going to have to really get strict about um, rationing stuff out, especially with all of the newcomers. And she ends up asking Boyd, like, do you want to tell me what happened out there? And he just don't say nothing, which... I don't know why we not communicate. If the sole goal and focus, the number one priority is figuring this thing out and getting out, we should be sharing everything. 
you saw the man chained up. You went through this portal tree, um, the worms and those, like everything. I don't know. Whatever the hell, child. He don't tell Donna nothing, child. Like I said earlier about when I was talking about him talking to his son. He's just keeping this whole thing secret. Partly, I'm presuming he's still processing. Partly, he don't want anybody to know what's happening to him with this cut that the guy chained up gave him. Because he doesn't even understand what's happening himself. Though, I'm not sure why he's not telling not one person not even his deputy not even his son but whatever now Kenny and Ellis end up going out into the woods for the traps that they set to catch little animals and stuff so we have food and Ellis goes out also with the agenda to pick flowers for Fatima now they end up coming across the young lady who we saw with her boyfriend from the bus that ran to the bar and we saw the boyfriend open the door and then they just cut the scene and we didn't get to see what happened with them we find her her name is Kelly her boyfriend was Brian and she stuck to the tree with the little rod going through her head, but she's still alive. And she ends up just not in pain, very coherent talking. And we jump to the biggest dribble of them all, Christy and her fiance. When I tell y'all, I care more about the relationship between the ants in my front yard than I care about the relationship between Christy and her fiance. It's so annoying. And it's actually pretty nonsensical because ever since we've seen the fiance, when we had that first night when we was forcing everybody to stay in the diner, she has this attitude towards Christy as if Christy chose to up and leave her and never come back. As if she herself is not in the same exact situation. You're in a musket town that you can't leave. You have no say so in this. But she has this attitude and contempt with Christy. There's this rock she painted for Christy. And she's like, Kim, oh, it's just sitting there on your nightstand. What else is this supposed to be, girl? Like, what exactly do you expect from Christy? So it doesn't make any sense. So it makes it even more annoying to see the interactions between them. And then Christy has, like, no spine when dealing with her fiancé. It's just very weird. You would think... This would be a happy reunion on the fiance's part. Maybe not initially when she first, first see her in town and she doesn't understand, know, or believe what's happening. But at this point in episode three, when you know about these supernatural monsters, when you know we stuck in this town, why are we still having this energy? It was so irksome. But then Kenny runs in obviously like an emergency like Christy we need you like he in a rush in a like we, we, we need you we gotta go it's an emergency and y'all the slow moving of Christy going and talking to the fiance and the fiance saying her name and like trying to get her to stay girl it's an emergency like what are y'all doing like I'm supposed to stay here with you and have this romantic relationship melodrama when Kitty just bust in with an emergency. What are we doing? What are we doing? <laughs> now we also have Jim dumbass. Y'all already know I can't stand Jim, Tabitha or Julie. <laughs> Ever since season one, I've just never liked them. But he was told by Christy that he's lucky. He needs to take it easy. Like his lung messed up. He got broken ribs. And instead of laying in bed, this fool focused on the light from the exit sign and standing up on the chair to go investigate that. For what? For why? To what avail? And we have the Looney Tune old lady from the bus come in. They keep popping her in and out. I really could care less about her. Whatever. Whatever. I'm not even theorizing whatever the hell that's going to add up to because it ain't going to add up to nothing, child. But anyway, he ends up, Jim ends up hurt. He has to sit down. He has this interaction with the lady and... <laughs> 
what y'all want me to say? <laughs> Now, we end up seeing Victor back in his room. And y'all know how you watch a TV show and the police come to do a search warrant on your house and your stuff be all messed up, stuff be broken and be everywhere. That's how Victor's room looks. So Victor is upset. He doesn't know what happened with his room. Um, the young lady from Community House tells him, oh, I saw, you know, the Matthews kid and I saw Jade in here. So he goes to Jade. And Jade whole Jade don't annoy me. Like he's fine, but his whole reaction to Victor was so ridiculous, bro. You violated me. You came up in my room and went through my stuff and didn't just go through my stuff. You took something and you left the room a wreck. But somehow Jade got the attitude. Now, they end up having this interaction, and Victor wants his violin back that Jay took. And as he's asking for it back, Jay just still holding it, and he's just talking, whatever. But he ends up giving Victor back his violin. Victor walks off, and Jay shows him the picture that he found and was like, who is this guy? He was drawing the symbol. I'm seeing it. This kid, this is you, right? And he ends up... Victor don't want to talk about nothing. He don't, you know, want to have this conversation. And Jade is like, don't you want to go home? But when you think about it, everybody has some place to get back to. Victor has been here since he was a child. This, at this point, this is Victor's home. If they were able to get free of this place right now, where the hell would Victor go? Like this is Victor's home. There is nowhere for him to go back to or have any semblance of, I mean, I just feel like the whole, let's get out of here. Can't we go back home? That's no real incentive or for Victor really, because he's been here since he has spent his entire life pretty much in this town. <laughs> So Victor ends up just walking off from Jade and Jade is just like, well, F you or something like that. He says, and it's like, bro, that's not how you approach somebody. You don't go into their room and I don't care. You thought he was dead and all this other stuff, child. <laughs> but Jade gone Jade. <laughs> He's really the least like insufferable of the insufferable characters. Like Jay, he fine. Like his reaction to Victor is very on brand for Jay, but it don't really bother me like some of the other characters. Now they end up telling us that Brian was tortured and killed by the monsters that come out at night and they made Kelly watch and we have this long drawn out death for Kelly. We have Christy holding her hand and pretending to write this note for her mother because she tells her cell phones don't work when Kelly asks for her phone. And she has, uh, Christy has this conversation away from Kelly with Kenny and Ellis about, you know, even if we were in a hospital, this would be like a 15, 16 hour surgery. There's no options except to kill her. And really though, they have this long drawn out death for a character that we don't even most freaking know. Like it has no real impact on the audience because we don't know this character. <laughs> so it's kind of like, what's the point? Like, we're not invested in this character or her death. We met her and now she dead. We met her, she dying. Like, <laughs> now, we do have a moment where suddenly Kelly isn't just calm and chill and peaceful. Suddenly, she, she, what, she said something. She said, she was like, do y'all hear that? And then she starts freaking out and screaming in pain. And that's when Boyd comes up. And this didn't make any sense to me. When we were talking about having to end Kelly's life, and Kenny is like, so how will we do it? And he suggests shooting her. Christy is like, I'm not going to have her last moments with a gun to her head, but shooting her would have been way more humane than pulling this rod out of her head and have her screaming in agony. She would not have had to die with the gun to her head because first of all, the girl stuck. She can't even turn her head. Kenny 
could have went up behind her. She would have had no idea a gun was her head. And y'all could have just killed her real quick with a gunshot. I don't know why the better option was to have Boyd pull this rod through her skull. Which it wasn't fast. Boyd had to struggle and pull the rod. What up, child? <laughs> now... Boyd ends up finding Donna in the greenhouse and having a conversation with her and explaining to her about Kelly and her boyfriend, Brian. And then he goes on to say that when he was in the service, you know, his, his squad was in riding back to somewhere child. And <laughs> I'm sorry. And, uh, <laughs> and the convoy blows up and the first person he ever watched die was Corporal Brian Kelly. And he's wondering if that means anything. We know it don't. We know it won't. We know it ain't. <laughs> but he ends up having this with Donna. And he starts to walk away when she asks him something about, you know, what happened when he went out into the woods and he starts to just walk away and she's like, no, you don't get to do that. You don't get to just dump this on me. Also, and I forgot to say, because it's pretty pointless, but <laughs> I forgot to say that Boyd has a conversation at his wife's grave about how can any of this be real? And maybe you and Ellis are by my hospital bed wanting me to open my eyes. What y'all want me to say about that? <laughs> He's just questioning, is any of this real? And maybe you guys are waiting for me to open my eyes. Whatever. Now, <laughs> I'm sorry. Y'all know I was done with this show. <laughs> now, we have Fatima with Elgin. And she's like, I'm your proxy. And he asks her about if there's a lake or body of water and she takes him to it. And she asks, how did he even know? And he's like, I saw it. Y'all, we really ain't getting nothing from Elgin. I mean, he had his little vision on the bus. He saw it, you know, when it comes to the water. <laughs> I mean, the story is going nowhere fast. So, y'all, I got nothing for y'all. I got nothing to theorize. I got nothing to speculate because why? The writers don't. The writers are just making this up as they go. Literally. They have no idea where it's going. But we know it ain't going nowhere, y'all. Y'all, are y'all in denial? Do y'all not understand this ain't going nowhere? <laughs> it's just going to be question, 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 question. Mystery, mystery, mystery. Piled on, piled on, piled on. We're going to get to the season finale. It's going to end on a cliffhanger, just like season one's finale, with no answers. Y'all know that, right? Like, I hate to be the one that has to break it to y'all, but that's where we're going. Nowhere. <laughs> Now, Ellis ends up with Fatima at the diner and he asks her to marry him right now because they did get engaged, but they were supposed to wait until they got home to get married. But he ends up saying this place doesn't get to decide when we get to be happy. So, yeah, they get married. And then we end up seeing Ellis and Tabitha on their porch. And Ellis has this puzzle that he got from the storage place from Kenny's mom. She let him have it. And Tabitha ends up having a conversation with Ethan saying, look, I know you like to look at everything as a challenge or a quest, but I need you to know. And Ethan cuts her off and he's like, look, I know this place is dangerous. I know it's not just make believe. I promise I'll be careful. And when he finally finishes the puzzle, which doesn't even look like, like a traditional you know, flat puzzle. It looks more like a Jenga puzzle because it's like a tower. But when he finally finishes it, we realize and Tabitha realizes that this is actually the same little tower that she saw underground where the monster sleep when she was trying to make it through those tunnels with Victor. So how it went from underground to the storage 
who knows? <laughs> but at this moment when he gets it completed, that's when Tabitha sees those two dead kids again and she rushes him in the house. She won't tell him what's wrong. She just runs in the house. And I feel like I would have got that thing out of there, away from my home. If you feel like it's eerie and he puts it together and you saw it on the ground and you see the dead kid, I don't want this thing here because I don't know what it is or what it could be bringing or manifesting to us. Now we end up at the end of the episode seeing Kenny going to the basement of the church looking to see, I think he went under there to see if Father Cartridge had any supplies in the basement. And that's when we find Sarah. So the last time we saw Sarah, of course, was the season finale of season one when she told Boyd to go through the tree and she would be right behind him. And now we're seeing that she ended up in the basement of the church. And I'm presuming she's been here this whole time since Boyd, you know, went through the tree and we had that whole thing. Now... Now, I don't expect the big overarching mystery to be solved, but the fact that none of the little mini mysteries and questions are being solved or answered and we literally just keep throwing in this fake suspense and these little mysteries of all these these little things that keep happening and they're showing us and you're feeling like maybe it's all going to be connected, but it's not y'all. I'm so uninvested. Do y'all really want me to continue talking about this show? <laughs> Cause I got nothing to give y'all. I mean, I could recap it, but I really got nothing for y'all. I did not enjoy sitting through this episode. I'm not looking forward to sitting through the rest because it, it's going to not only okay so I maybe it's just me as a viewer I want a payoff you know what I mean I don't want to have to use my own imagination I don't want stuff to end with a question mark I want to sit through something trying to figure it out trying to look at the clues that the showrunners and writers are giving us and trying to solve a mystery and then at the end the series solves the mystery and I figure out whether I was right or not or close to have no payoff it just takes the wind out of my sails when I'm watching something but also take that out of the equation it's just not a fun series to watch anymore I was very engaged with season one partly like I said because I felt like there would be you know an answer to the mystery and I was trying to see if I could figure it out but it just felt more entertaining to watch the characters now are so insufferable and then they're putting in this relationship drama that I could care less about we're not really getting any monsters that seems to not even be a threat currently. Everyone is, is safe and tucked in at night. And also, my favorite characters of Boyd and Donna, they're they're not acting like very good leaders right now. It's like they're cracking under the pressure. And I completely get, you know, having the weight of this situation on them. And even Donna was telling Boyd, I need to know that you're back. These people need you. I tried to do what you do just for a day and look what happened. So I get that. But it's like the decisions being made are so just stupid. Like what is Boyd even walking around? Around doing at this point like seriously and even when it came to Boyd when he popped up with the guy chained to the wall the choices and decisions he was making it's like Boyd and Donna are no longer smart capable people that everybody looks to to lead them like for a reason we look to y'all but what are they doing now I don't know the characters what they're having the characters do is just feeling so odd and the way everything is progressing i mean it's really not progressing like people are doing things and people are talking but it's like running in place what is anyone doing right now really as far as character motivations i mean it's supposed to be figuring out a way to get out of here but as we look at this episode what was anybody doing <laughs> seriously thank you so much for watching this video for supporting the channel i'll see you in the next one thank you